o'clock news starts right now. And we begin with some late breaking news out of Uvalde, where the tech campus at Southwest Texas Junior College has been evacuated due to a bomb threat. According to the school's social media, that threat came in around 3 o'clock this afternoon. Law enforcement cleared the building for which the threat was issued. Now officials are waiting for bomb sniffing canines from San Antonio to get there to assist. College officials are asking people to stay away from the campus until further notice. And we are keeping our eyes on the sky and the radar waiting and hoping for some much needed rain. Yeah, we've been watching storms to the north and east this afternoon, rooting for some rain, much needed cool off. Some people are seeing it. Adam Kasky has been keeping a close eye on this radar. Adam, what is it looking like out there? Well, unfortunately, across San Antonio, not much happening, and there's still time, still a few hours for some development and a few flare ups locally. But what we've really been watching lately is this action in the hill country, and this has been moving to the southwest, overspreading parts of Kendall County now. And unfortunately, some severe thunderstorm activity in parts of northern Kerr County and Gillespie County, including Fredericksburg and surrounding areas where we did have wind gusts up to about 60 miles per hour, causing a little bit of damage. And you look at the radar right now, this is not non severe, just a bit of lightning and thunder and some heavy rainfall, which is good. We like we like to see the heavy rain near Sisterdale, Comfort along I-10, Nelson City, all the way up through Comfort and beyond. Even as you go toward Kerrville, some heavy rain. This is starting to build to the southwest. So Bernie, you've got pretty good odds here of at least a quick splash. Even Fair Oaks Ranch, you could see some of that activity. And then you go farther to the west and some heavier action there, particularly as you get into southern Kerr County. So some heavier rain, maybe even some very small non damaging hail southwest of the city of Kerrville and even up in northern Edwards County. But I want to shift the focus over here. Now this green line that you see, I'm going to basically draw this right along that green line. That's the gust front and it's basically a big puff of wind that's essentially acting like a mini little cold front to help lift the air and generate some showers and storms. And that's why we've had some of this activity develop behind it, particularly up in Bulverde. Right now, one little downpour right along 281. So as this gust front continues to move through San Antonio, more of these little showers are possible Oh, there's a new one. Look, we just got the new scan. There it is. That gust front just developed this shower. Uh, basically, Timberwood Park and far north Stone Oak, Bulverde Bulver Road, and just north of Johnson High School and east of 281. So that's why we're watching this green line as it moves into Alamo Heights now, approaches the airport, and it's moving to the southwest at about 20 miles per hour. There's the progression of it. And even around Stockdale, a little bit of activity that's developed as a direct result of that outflow boundary. So we still have an opportunity over the next few hours. Take another close look at this, even how much rain has fallen and where and <sighs> temperatures the next several days. We could actually get a little below 100. I'll tell you when in just a sec. Sounds good. Thank you, Adam. Let's go to the border now in the Del Rio sector alone, which includes Eagle Pass. Apprehensions of undocumented immigrants are in the thousands just this week. Yeah, for the last two days, Border Patrol agents have stopped 4,400 migrants and Chief Patrol Agent Jason Owen says there's no sign of things slowing down. Alicia Barrera is in Eagle Pass, where a new processing facility hopes to help with some of this backlog. Marco, his wife, thank you, thank you. and seven-year-old daughter have traveled all the way from Venezuela. He says the situation back home is tough. There's not enough water or food. They, along with dozens of others, had just crossed the Rio Grande when we met them, desperate for shade, water, and a chance for a better future. <laughs> But this group is small compared to what agents have witnessed in the last two weeks, about 10 miles west. We've heard about the big groups crossing. You're talking 300 up to 500 people. And once they cross the river, they'll walk along this stretch of land here, still having to make a two and a half mile trek onto the main road. As soon as we detect people approaching the river from the south side, our folks are moving. They are then brought to the new facility in Eagle Pass, where the average stay is less than 72 hours. The one that we just opened up has a capacity of 1,000 people. The previous two days, though, are high water marks for us that we've not seen since the, the Haitian migration back in September. In each of those two days, we apprehended nearly 2,200 individuals in a 24-hour period. Yet, not all who turn themselves in are granted status in the U.S. 
So if we get folks that, that are amenable under Title 42, they are expelled immediately. For us in the Del Rio sector, maybe 25 to 30 percent of what we're seeing right now is amenable to Title 42. Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. Meanwhile, the remains of eight migrants who died as part of the human smuggling tragedy we saw in San Antonio last month have been taken back to Mexico. The remains taken back on a Mexican Air Force plane that landed at an airport near Mexico City late yesterday. These were the first of 26 people from Mexico among the 53 people who died. The plan was for that Air Force plane to return to San Antonio to retrieve eight more bodies. Government officials say they will repatriate the remains of 25 of the 26 people from Mexico in accordance with their wishes of the family. Migrants from Honduras and Guatemala were also among those who died in the deadliest known smuggling attempt in the United States. And new at six, since the COVID-19 pandemic began, we have been keeping a close watch on what's happening with the Bear County Criminal District Court backlog. Over the past couple of years, those numbers have kept going up. But as Erica Hernandez reports, some good news. The new data shows that backlog is now close to being what it was before the pandemic. We've resolved a significant number of cases. 379th District Court Judge Ron Rangel is pleased with the latest numbers. Over the past 17 weeks, the 10 criminal district courts have made significant headway on the backlog. Since March 13, 34,000 cases have been on the docket. Of those cases, about 6,000 have been cleared. If those numbers stay the same, within a year, the courts will be back in pre-pandemic levels. Before the pandemic started, we had already started a series of reforms, of criminal justice reforms, including um, issues related to bail. Um, we accelerated those when the pandemic began. And so those have actually shown a lot of uh, fruition, or they've come to fruition as it relates to how the numbers have been affected. As the county's population has increased, the amount of courts has not. And Judge Rahel says they will soon be adding at least one other court to also help with the backlog, as well as help relieve the jail population. This would be a court that would handle specifically folks that are in custody. Those are the kind of cases that we need to move in order to release or relieve the jail of their of their uh, staffing issues. While the latest numbers are encouraging, the work isn't over yet, as the courts will continue to push cases forward. We're pushing cases as much as we can, and frankly, there's only so much we can push. If the courts pushed any more, then you would start to see injustices in the courthouse. Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. A family along with 19 other tenants are now suing the San Antonio Housing Authority after an apartment it owned caught fire. A civil lawsuit notice claims the lack of care from burning tree apartments owned by Saha ultimately caused the fire. Camelia Juarez has been following the story since the fire happened nearly a month ago and now she brings us the latest. 17-year-old Jayla Campion didn't know it would be her last time coming home. And I saw a big orange flash across the window, like on the balcony, like it looked like the sky was orange. Campion's three-story apartment building at the Burning Tree Complex was burnt beyond repair, according to the fire department. The fire left Campion's family homeless and killed both her dogs. We were not able to keep nothing. Nothing was able to be saved. We're lucky that we're alive. A report from the San Antonio Fire Department lists the cause of fire as undetermined, but the civil lawsuit notice given to Saha and the apartment complex claims appliances were installed incorrectly, leading to an electrical fire. Campion says their negligence has taken a mental toll on her and her family. I'll see restaurants that have smoke coming out and I immediately get like feared or like worried. And the same thing with the fire alarms, because the fire alarms didn't go off when they were supposed to. Through the lawsuit, they hope to be compensated for personal property they lost, smoke inhalation injuries, and items needed to restore their living situation. I want to see them take responsibility for what they have done, all the wrong that they have caused us. It's not just us who lost, it's everybody in those apartments who lost. Lawyers representing the tenants have given an official notice to Burning Tree as well as Saha. And within 60 days, an official lawsuit will be filed. So far, Burning Tree has not answered any of our calls and the San Antonio Housing Authority has not made anyone available to speak about the lawsuit, but they did say that housing should be available to the tenants. Camelia Juarez, Kisa 12 News. Check out Transguide right now. We're at Highway 90 and 211.
heading northwest and you can see a big back up there. Not exactly sure what is happening. If there's some sort of a stalled vehicle, there's a lot of construction in this area as well. But you can see the access road, especially where I'm guessing that's uh, 211 getting on Highway 90 basically stopped. You can see some trucks there as well, maybe causing part of the slowdown as well. But we're going to continue to monitor this. A lot of construction, like I said, in this area. This is US 90 at State Highway 211. Well, the drought is gripping most of Texas. It's led to questions about the water quality in our rivers and lakes. Jacobs Well near Wimberley closed two weeks ago for swimming because of the threat of high bacteria levels. RJ Marquez spoke with Nueces River Authority officials about testing water and the current state of some of the most visited swimming areas in South Texas. Visiting the Laker River is always popular during summer, but low flow is causing concerns about standing water. The warm water means it's stagnant. We don't recommend people swimming in stagnant uh, waters. Sam Shigarek is the director of water quality programs for the Nueces River Authority. They test the water at more than 50 sites across South Texas. We generally encounter a lot of low flow conditions in the Nueces River Basin. In the hill country, in the headwaters, uh, there's usually pretty consistent flow coming from the springs. Shigarek says despite the lack of rain, the Nueces River Authority has not found harmful levels of bacteria in the water, and that includes the Frio and Atascosa Rivers. We haven't identified any water quality concerns or impairments in the upper basin streams due to low flows. Um, it's, it's pretty much uh, good quality water. There's just not a whole lot of it. The Texas Commission on Environmental Quality has a threshold for dangerous bacteria in freshwater settings, but Shigurik said nothing has come close to reaching those numbers. But he does caution being safe around creeks that people do not visit often. Smaller creeks that are kind of muddy bottomed and they aren't the best place for swimming, and those usually do have higher uh, bacteria numbers. The TCEQ also says drinking the water or ingesting it through your nose is an easy way to get bacteria into your system. Shigarek says it's also not a good idea to kick up the bottom of the riverbed or lake, especially if it's warm water. Anytime the water is turbid or, or murky in places where it is generally clear, that's a good sign that you should probably stay out of the water. RG Marquez, KSAT 12 News. Well, tough to hear. You can't go to the water when it's this hot, but look at this promising clouds right there. Look out in the distance there. Kind of looks like some rain. Adam Kasky gives us the very latest when we come back. Welcome back. I'm Stefania Jimenez and here's what we're working on for you tonight on the night beat. Now turning up the thermostat and turning off the lights. The effort to get San Antonio's larger buildings to lower their energy use and how similar plans are working out in other cities. Plus, dirty food containers, dead insects, yuck. We're going to go behind the kitchen door and you're going to see what else health inspectors found at three local restaurants. We'll see you for those stories and more tonight on The Night Beat. Well, two people in Bear County now among the growing number of people testing positive for monkeypox. Metro Health says that there are these are the first confirmed cases locally and the threat to the community is still low. Both people are isolating and following the recommended protocols. Now, statewide, there are 42 confirmed cases of monkeypox. Health officials say the viral disease is rare. Symptoms include skin lesions lesions in the genital groin and anal regions that could be confused with rashes caused by herpes herpes and syphilis. Now other symptoms of monkeypox include fever, chills, headache, muscle aches and backache, exhaustion and swollen lymph nodes as well. All right, we showed you the clouds just a few minutes ago and they look promising. I'm glad some people are getting some rain. They hold my hope for my garden. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> At, at least there is some hope today. Yeah, right? some exactly. Getting it. Most of it has been up in the hill country, but there have been reports from Fredericksburg and off Harper Road, just about a mile off I-10 of tree damage and one to two foot diameter trees down. So there has been some damage, particularly Fredericksburg area, and then in some parts of Kerr County, isolated in nature with this action that's moving to the southwest. Now, this right here is very broken in nature, and right now it's not considered severe. It's just heavy rain, some lightning and thunder associated with it. But it is moving to the southwest at about 25 miles per hour right now. You know, we're going to track this just like this. Pretend it's one big line, even though it's not. This is the timeline of your opportunity, at least, for some of the rain. And that would be Lakey at about 631, assuming you get hit by one of those showers. Again, this is a very broken line, but the opportunity 
is there. Barksdale at about 656 PM and then you get into Bernie. We just talked about this earlier. Bernie having the opportunity, especially at the end of the five o'clock. Here you go. This is the heavy rain in Bernie, maybe even a little bit of pea size hail around Fair Oaks Ranch and lightning and thunder. Nothing severe, nothing damaging, at least not expected to be with this, but something we'll watch as there is that off chance that we could have a rogue strong to severe storm. This is along 46 just south and east of Champion High School, Fair Oaks Ranch, where we have the heaviest rain and the potential for the non damaging pea sized hail right here along Cibolo Ridge Trail. And a lot of this is just drifting southwestward or building. You see new showers building southwestward, so these aren't exactly the easiest to track out and put a timeline on for you. But assuming this does continue to drop to the southwest, then let's just do this for you. Put it out there. Assuming it does that, well, it might. There's no cities along the path of that, but I do see it more building southward along this right along I 10, and that's because of the gust front that's moving in. If you were watching Justin Horn earlier today, he was saying once that gust front makes it here, this broken green line, that's when we could have some showers developing, and it did just that, particularly up in the Stone Oak area, Timberwood Park, Bulverde Bul Road, Blanco Road 281, some heavy rain, and again, that action is just slowly drifting to the south, and that's about it. Even down near Elmendorf, some new action as well. And this is all behind this gust front and this line, that green line that you see there that's moving through town. That's from previous thunderstorms in northeast Texas earlier today, and they're kicking out this gust of wind that's then helping to lift the air and get a few showers going. So around Elmendorf area, some brief downpours even along 181 as you head toward Floresville as well. As that gust front continues to track to the southwest, you'll have that opportunity for some showers. It's not going to guarantee development, but it at least gives you the opportunity of development. So that gust front's going to make it to you. Clark High School at about 620 and uh, Lasoya at about 626 and some areas thereafter. It's moving at about 20 miles per hour. So Medina County within about an hour. So that's what we're seeing out there right now. That's the action. And some of those showers have dropped over an inch of rain in some lucky spots. Here's our future cast. It's a little overdone, but it does show some action lingering through seven o'clock. And then I think by about 10 o'clock, whatever's lingering out there is going to be coming to an end once we lose our daytime heating and our real instability in the atmosphere. Tomorrow, 10% chance. Tuesday of next week, a 20% chance. So a few chances through about 10 p.m. this evening and then uh, very slim pickings from there on out. It's had an impact on temperatures. 71 Kerrville and Fredericksburg, near 100, many other locations. Stinson 101 at the airport now in town. We're at 95 after a high temperature today of 102. Tomorrow, 76 in the morning, 98 the high temperature. It'll feel like 102, but tomorrow we're forecasting our first sub 100 degree day so far this month. Mostly upper 90s for high temperatures, and then we get back into 100 degrees by the weekend. By the way, Sahara dust increasing on Saturday should be the thickest on Sunday. You'll notice it at that point. You know what's going to happen? Everybody that's getting <clears throat> rain is going to go out, take a picture, take video, post it on social media, and then we're all going to have rain envy. That's it. <laughs> rain envy. I, I get that. Yeah. All right. Larry joins us now. Larry, I want to know mm -hmm. if there's a sense. Obviously, it's not about wins and losses. Yeah. But is there a sense that the Spurs are happy with what they're seeing from their youngsters? And talking and listening to Coach Mitch Johnson, he seems to love the aggression of okay. these guys. So I think he's pleased with how they're playing. They're unfortunately not getting wins in Las Vegas. But again, it's more about development right now. Keldon Johnson is in Las Vegas watching his uh, rookie teammates that will be joining him soon in the NBA. Plus, the Austin Gamblers, well, they're here in town to talk about the new team bull riding concept coming up. The Spurs led the Hawks by 15 points or three minutes left in the third quarter today and they blew it less than 30 seconds to go. Spurs on the break. Blake Wesley to Malachi Branham for the layup and the Spurs lead 86-85. The Hawks answer right back behind Tyson Etienne who drives, hangs and makes a tough layup off the window and they go up 87-86. Spurs get one more possession but Dominic Barlow turns it over and that's your ball game. Spurs fall 86-87. Wesley led the Spurs with 20 points. Kelton Johnson took in the game and had this to say. 
it was the first time I really got to see like our, our new rookies play uh, with each other, and uh, it was it was great. They was aggressive. They showed some great flashes of what they're gonna do next year for us. So uh, they definitely get a chance to play. You know, as everybody knows, we're re rebuilding. You know, we expect to come in, play hard, and, and win. In the WNBA, the Las Vegas Aces played at the New York Liberty this morning, the third meeting between the teams in the past eight days. Las Vegas opened the game on a 12-0 run and cruised from their 108-74. The Aces led 71-36 at halftime, scoring the most points ever in the first half of a WNBA game. Las Vegas shot 53.5% compared to 35% for the Liberty. Aces head coach Becky Hammond was pleased with her team. We haven't played a full 40 in probably about a month month and a half so it was just nice to see a full 40 obviously like i said when you're making shots it's if you're the other team it's super deflating on a on a certain level so um but yeah this this is you know I, I i've said this before even early in the season i don't think we've played our best basketball tonight was some of our best basketball overall and and that starts again on the defensive end with us the Aces are a West Best 17 and 7. Turning the golf, a blustery day in St. Andrews, Scotland, with the Open Championship teed off at the old golf course. Check out Ian Poulter working the flat stick. Ninth hole, second shot. He sinks a 54 yard putt for an eagle, hits the flag pin, and down it goes. He shot a three under 69. Rory McElroy started off his round on the right foot. First hole, 55 feet for birdie. And he finds the cup. Rory finished with a six under 66. American Cameron Young is the man after the first round, shooting a bogey free eight under 64 in his first career open championship. So Young leads Rory McElroy by two shots at eight under par, and Tiger Woods is way, way off the pace at six over par. The Austin Gamblers are in town to help promote the inaugural Professional Bull Riders Team Series, a new bull riding league for PBR that consists of eight teams playing in a 10 week regular season culminating in a team playoff in Las Vegas. We stopped by the media only event, the chicken and pickle today to learn more about the series. Two bull riding champions and members of the Austin Gamblers are excited to ride in the new team concept. The bull riding never had a competition like these, you know, uh, teams the whole season. Uh, I think it's going to be great and Everybody's so excited for these. I think it's going to be a lot different because um, usually like when we show up, we're just riding for ourselves and um, I mean, you can be frustrated that you bucked off, but now you're, now you're riding for four other guys that are on your team and, and you want to do your best just for them too because you don't want to let them down. Austin Gamblers are hosting a public event right now at the Chicken and Pickle and ends tonight at 7. The PBR Team Series starts July 25th in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Looks interesting. By the way, PBR for Pro Bowl riding, not Paps Blue Ribbon. <laughs> Thank you for the clarification. Just, just wanted to, you know, yeah. Yeah, point that out because, you know, where my head goes. Yes. Right away. <laughs> All right, we'll be right back with more of this guy. The January 6th House Select Committee says it will be up to the Department of Justice to decide whether a phone call allegedly made by former President Donald Trump to a potential witness in their investigation actually amounts to a crime. The timing of that phone call also being scrutinized as ABC's M. Nguyen reports. Sources say former President Trump called this person right after Cassidy Hutchison's very public testimony. New details on comments by House Select Committee Vice Chair Liz Cheney, raising the possibility of witness tampering reporting that Donald Trump tried to reach out to a witness amid their investigation into the deadly Capitol riot. Sources tell ABC News the former president tried to reach out to a member of the White House support staff who had been in contact with the January 6th panel, saying this person was not someone Trump would typically be in contact with. During Tuesday's hearing, Cheney made clear that the witness didn't answer Trump's call, but immediately contacted their lawyer. Their lawyer alerted us, and this committee has supplied that information to the Department of Justice. We will take any effort to influence witness testimony very seriously. 
when committee members were asked whether the alleged phone call amounted to witness tampering, which is a criminal offense, even if the attempt is unsuccessful, they said that's up to the DOJ to decide. All I know is that we have had a problem uh, with a pattern of witness tampering from the beginning. This comes as the committee is expected to hold another hearing next Thursday. Committee member Elaine Loria says the panel will go through the day of the insurrection minute by minute, detailing Trump's actions. What happened between the time that he left the stage and gave these inflammatory remarks and gave people the impression, such as our witness yesterday, the impression that he was going to himself march with this crowd to the Capitol? Despite previous testimony saying Trump knew and didn't care that his supporters had weapons that day, his congressional weapons. allies are standing by to him. They're going to try to paint Donald Trump as some type of a terrorist. Donald Trump is probably the greatest thing that's happened to this country in the last six years. Next week's hearing in primetime has not officially been announced by the panel, and it's not clear yet if it would be the final one. M1, ABC News, Washington. News around America, mortgage rates are going up again. The 30-year fixed rate mortgage average just over 5.5%, up from 5.5% the week before, and nearly twice the amount it was at this time last year. R rates rose to 5.81% in the middle of last month, but they dropped slightly after that uh, prior to this most recent increase. Freddie Mac's chief economist says rates are at, the, at a high not seen in more than a decade. Well, if you live in a special zip code in Bear County, you could be chosen to get an extra $500 a month. But what you do with that money could have big implications for generations of San Antonians to come. Ursula Perry explains a new $7.2 million study that could one day offer the keys to ending poverty and poor health in our community. The criteria for the new Methodist Healthcare Ministry study is simple live in one of these zip codes, be between the age of 19 and 60, and have a household income at or less than 150% of the federal poverty level. We're going to have 575 individuals with their families. Uh, they're all going to be located in Bear County. They're the 13 zip codes with the highest levels of poverty. The purpose of the two-year study? To figure out if two things together are the recipe to lift families out of poverty cash assistance and mentoring. And so we will give uh, some families $500 a month for these, for these two years. Uh, that's the cash assistance portion. Another portion is the mobility mentoring. Uh, so they will get coaches that we will provide for them. No cash, but coaches, which, which are expensive, uh, to meet with them frequently over those two years. Then there's a third group that'll be getting the combo, the cash and the coaching. Another group, the largest one, is the control group. It gets no assistance at all. I really have a dream that uh, the results of this study will be something that will, will create a ripple effect uh, throughout the world, hopefully. The initial blessing of being a part of the study will go to 575 people in Bear County, all of whom are going to get cash or counseling or both. But the next blessing is what it's going to give our community, which is an opportunity to find out how to lift hard-pressed families out of generational poverty and into good health. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. A new version of Netflix coming with the hope of getting more subscribers, which company the streaming giant is teaming up with to create Netflix with ads. Yeah, still to come. Sounds like regular TV. Yep. And Social Security recipients could be getting a bigger raise than they've gotten in past years. How much more? One advocacy group says it could be. Next. Look at this. People who get Social Security could see a pretty sizable increase next year, as much as 10.5%. That's according to a new estimate by the Senior Citizens League and Advocacy Group. The increase would add about $175 to the average monthly retiree benefit. Yeah, that estimate based on the June reading for an inflation measure used to calculate the annual cost of living adjustment. How much more retirees, Americans with disabilities, and other recipients will actually get won't be determined until the fall. The league says if inflation increases over the coming three months, that adjustment could be more than its current estimate. But if price hikes moderate, that bump could be less. All right, let's take a look outside. 92 degrees. Ooh, it got darker. 
the pot. I know. That is great. We have not seen a sky like that in quite some time, Adam Cassidy. Take a picture. It might not be around. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's nice to see. We're looking off to the northwest where we have some of the heaviest rain right now, northwest of San Antonio, especially along I-10 in the I-10 corridor. We'll take a close look at radar and what's ahead coming up just after the break. Well, you could be seeing some new emojis on your smartphone. A preview of the images being considered was just released from the emoji reference site Emojipedia. Just in time for the World Emoji Day this Sunday, the draft list includes a pushing hand, gestures that look like a high five, a shaking no face, a ginger root, maracas, and a hair pick. Also included a pink heart and a conda which is a traditional symbol of the Sikh faith. There's been a recent push in years for emojis to become more inclusive. The Unicode Consortium will give final approval of the new emojis this fall. That's the nonprofit that oversees global emoji standards and new releases. The <laughs> Unicode Consortium. The emojis would then be released as software updates to major platforms sometime late this year or early next year. Very important stuff yes. that committee does. Yeah. And there has been a lot of buzz about Netflix introducing a cheaper version with ads in the last several months. Well, it looks like it is happening. It, it's going to give uh, potential subscribers at least a, a less expensive option. Netflix and Microsoft introduced uh, the, uh, the team that they're going to create an ad-supported version of their streaming service. Does that mean, like they're gonna raise, that mean they're going to raise prices oh, if, you do, if you don't want? commercials mm, yeah Netflix point. CEO Reed Hastings resisted that option the commercial option for years but the company going through one of the roughest periods in its 25 year history Netflix says it lost 200,000 subscribers in the first quarter of 2022 they expect to lose another 2 million in the second quarter the service currently has 221.6 million subscribers globally the New York Times reported in May that Netflix told employees the ad supported version may come by the end of 2022 all right, it is one of the easiest sides to make and it's just happens to me America's favorite. Today oh, yeah. is National Mac and Cheese Day. All you need to make it is of course macaroni, noodles, cream or milk and some cheese. But the classic is made with cheddar or American. Love me some mac and cheese. By the way, the classic still very popular, but you can sp spice it up with maybe some Gouda. Maybe sprinkle in some bacon, jalapenos, breadcrumbs, add some hamburger to promote it to the main dish, maybe pulled pork. I even had it with brisket here in San Antonio. Yeah, that makes sense. It's good. Yeah, you know, a lot of that? variety. Smoke Shack. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. I knew it. I knew it was there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. By the way, when I want to talk about us rooting on this rain, Patty next to me was literally earlier in the show, rooting on the rain, like I saw her go. Yep, rooting it on. Like that. Bring it on, Ruth. Yeah, a lot of people are, and who's especially celebrating right now, those in Bernie, Fair Oaks Ranch, even Helotus now started to get on in on this activity, especially Helotus, you know, in Northwest Bear County, just outside of 1604. This is the progression over the past hour, some heavy rainfall, a lot of lightning and thunder within this. I'm going to stop the loop so you can see where it's still raining heavily along I-10, Sisterdale all the way down to Bernie, toward Leon Springs, Dominion, Helotus, and this is moving to the southwest at about 25 miles per hour. So we can plot this out for you, see what kind of communities would be in line from that now that it has a more distinct motion to it. Uh, that would make it to Pipe Creek at about 707, Lake Hills at 715-ish, Medina Lake about the same time, obviously, Bandera then potentially 7.30 p.m., but Bandera, you already have a little shower and downpour just south of the city of Bandera, cowboy capital there, and it just developed south of Bandera. You could get still some of the activity that's still in Kendall County and parts of Kerr County. This is all building southward toward Highway 90. You're looking at northern Medina County, just north of Highway 90. This broken activity would probably make it to Highway 90 within the next 30 minutes to 45 minutes. And then a severe thunderstorm warning. This is for Edwards County, northeastern Kinney County. County. This is yellow box that you see here, this yellow polygon, and this is until 715 p.m. for the potential of a wind gust up to 60 miles per hour within this thunderstorm. So that's 
Real, far western Real County, but especially southern Edwards County, northeastern Kinney County, northwestern Uvalde County. That's for this storm. That's pretty much just moving due south. We're seeing different storm motions with a lot of this action. And I know there aren't a lot of communities officially within that path, uh, but I can at least track it for its distance away from Highway 90. And that's about 37 miles. We're talking about an hour, 15 minutes, an hour and a half until that would make it to Highway 90, assuming that it stays completely intact. Now, what we've had around San Antonio, let's focus on other parts of town here. A few little pop up downpours, one right over downtown, putting this into motion. You see how the gust front moved in that green line and then poof, a brief downpour right over the heart of San Antonio, right over downtown and now moving toward the south side and southwest side, Lone Star Brewery area, Highway 90 and uh, Burbank High School. That's where we're seeing the leftovers of the rain there. We'll track a little farther east of town and there's some activity left over southern southeastern Bear County and especially uh, just along 181 Floresville, Poth, Fall City, Carn City. That's where this gust front moved through and it's done its job in terms of generating some of these showers. And earlier today, you know, Justin Horn was tracking this some thunderstorm activity in northeast Texas saying a little gust front left over wind from it would be moving our way and potentially developing some storms and it's doing its job. But I think our opportunity is only through about 10% or I should say only through 10 p.m. thereafter, the chances drop off by 11 o'clock, only about 10%. So next few hours, that's our opportunity. But once that gust front moves through, your chances start to drop off with every hour that passes. Here's our drought monitor, not good, updated every Thursday. 94% of the state in drought, extreme and exceptional drought across our area. It's good to see some dark clouds off in the distance. 102, that was our high temperature today, missing the record by three degrees. Right now we're at 95, that's at the airport, but 90, or 72 in Kerrville, 70 in Rock Springs, but not far away in Del Rio, 104. It's a rain cooled air in parts of the hill country. Fredericksburg at 70, Comfort down to 86, Bernie, down to 72, but 102 in Castroville and Divine. We'll start the day tomorrow at 76, 98, the high temperature. That would be our first day below 100 so far all month. And we're expecting upper 90s for most of us. Then back to 100, 101 this weekend. Saharan dust, expect it late Saturday and especially through Sunday. You'll notice that Saharan dust back in place. Rain chances pretty slim. Only a 10% chance tomorrow, slightly better odds along the coast, and then a 20% chance as we get into Tuesday of next week. I'm just kind of, I'm kind of curious if we have any rain on any of our city trans camps. guides out there. Uh, I, I haven't seen any. Yeah. But um, I curious. can move our. The problem with some of our city cams right now is that the lenses are very dirty. Yeah. And they haven't had any rain to rinse them off. You can't just go up there and take a little Windex to it. That's not what we're talking <laughs> about on, on top of these buildings, right? It doesn't work that way. Yeah. Uh, anyway, quick uh, thermometer winner today. Is the AR active here? Let's see. Yes, it is. Good. We're ready to go. And it is Brianna Armstrong of San Antonio. I sent you an email a little bit ago. You're the winner of the homemade thermometer. Keeping it short and sweet today. Sorry about that, but... Rain on the radar. It's good to see. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love that. And, you know, if you can't get rain, it's good to at least see other people are getting rain. If the yes. big clouds off the airport yep. look great. Yeah. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Kim. All right. In case you missed it is next. Here's today's in case you missed it. It is Thursday, the 14th of July. The first cases of monkeypox have been reported in Bear County. SA Metro Health says right now there are two confirmed cases. Both people currently isolating. All close contacts have been notified. Metro Health says the current risk to the public is low, but they do want people to know what to look out for. The symptoms include unexplained rashes or lesions, fever, chills, and swollen lymph nodes. Metro Health Director Claude Jacob says the disease does not spread easily from person to person without direct contact, so the chance of exposure is minimal. An abandoned house fire now under investigation after firefighters received a call about a house in flames on the city's south side. San Antonio fire investigators are working to determine the cause of that fire at the abandoned home around South New Braunfels Avenue and East South Cross. They say when they arrived, the home was already in flames. The fire was put out pretty quickly and no injuries. The fight 
to protect women's access to health care in terms of abortion continuing today in D.C. Lawmakers have introduced a bill that would ensure that women who cross state lines for an abortion will not face legal consequences. All of this comes down to one question. Who should get to make the personal decisions for a woman? We are above Ohio watching skydivers jump out of a plane. This time it's 48 of them. They're jumping out of three different planes and then they all managed to get together and create a formation. You can see them all coming together right there. The previous skydiving formation record, 33. That was over a decade ago. After a few seconds, they all let go, ripped the cord, and landed safely. All right, before we go, let's take a look at some of the trans guides around town. If you didn't get rain, you're getting it at you. This gives Patty. you some rain envy. Yeah, as Patty said, Nighty and Nogalitos. Look at that. Yeah, we also like there's a little. Little what? Little spew sprinkles on the camera. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Spackles on the camera. They, 90 and couples also a good area where it looks like they got some rain out there and hopefully it is still active. Let's check in with Adam Kasky. Well, it is Ed, the most active part right here in Bear County is northwestern Bear County. We're saying between 1604 and I-10, so especially Holotus, uh, just moved through Leon Springs, Scenic Oaks, uh, Brandeis High School, all the way around to Taft High School, towards SeaWorld, and about to Alamo Ranch area. And we're seeing this development drift kind of to the southwest is what it's doing. It's also building southward a bit, just outside of Lackland Air Force Base. You see that gust front that moved through that green line, then kicked up these showers. So we've got some on the southwest side of town as well there, just within 1604. You look ahead, only a 10% chance tomorrow, 98, then back to 100 to 101 this weekend. All right, we'll see you on the night beat at 10.